What's up, everybody? How's it going? Today I'm talking about this book, Burmese Days by George Orwell. Um, for those of you who might be familiar with George Orwell or those of you who um, are not familiar with George Orwell, he's a well-known author. Um, many of you guys might be familiar with George Orwell because he's the author of 1984 which is about like a totalitarian government that watches everything you do. You know, you've heard the slogans like Big Brother is watching. That all comes from George Orwell. He also wrote a book called Animal Farm, which is like uh, kind of like an allegory to, you know, Soviet Union Russia. But anyway, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with a lot of the other books that he wrote. And I've read one of his other books called Down and Out in Paris and London. So this is a new book that I've never read from George Orwell before. Um that details his time in Burma, right, and around India. And interesting fact about George Orwell, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that he was born in Burma. So this is kind of like taking place um, around the place that he was born. But anyway, the idea behind this book is this book is based off of, you know, it was written a long time ago. I think it was like written in like the 1930s. So this novel's main character is all around a guy named James Flory. It centers way back in the day when India and Burma was like a colony of the British, right? I don't know the most about this, like, history or anything like that, but, like, you know, India used to be like a colony of the British. And this is at a time when, like, uh, you know, the English were, like, situated inside of places like Burma and they were treated better than, like, Indians and different people who were native to that place. Um, and so throughout this book, you just see a lot of it centers around a lot of the, uh, you know, just bad treatment of many of the native people in that place. You know, there's, like, a higher emphasis placed on the Englishmen. You know, the Englishmen are, like, better. So the back of the book says... Honest and evocative, this novel focuses on a handful of Englishmen who meet at the European club to drink whiskey and to alleviate the acute and unspoken loneliness of life in Burma during the waning days of British imperialism. So this book starts off focusing on this one character named Yupo Kin, right? A lot of the characters in this novel have like a name that's native or like Indian or Burmese. So <clears throat> I might butcher some of these names, but... This book starts off with this character, Yu Po Kin. Um, he's described as being like this really like terrible person, this very corrupt uh, like magistrate, right? So he has a lot of like political or social power in that area. And the novel actually starts off with this guy who, um, you know, he it starts off with him as a kid and how when he's a kid, he sees like the British forces like coming into his city and he realizes, you know, like, that the British are always going to be superior to the Burmese and to the Indians in terms of, like, military strength. So what he does, so ever since he was a little kid, he's been working his way up, like, the social ladder, gaining all this power. And, you know, in the beginning of the novel, he actually is, like, kind of arguing with his wife because his wife's like, you know, what are you doing all this for, you know? we're not really happy, you're not really happy, you know, all this power and this money that we've accumulated, you know, it hasn't really created much of a happy life for us, but he kind of ignores her and just goes about his business, trying to make his moves in terms of, like, you know, his strategy for gaining and maintaining his power, right? So you see that, that this one guy, Yu Po Kin, he doesn't really care about anything besides maintaining his own personal power in the social uh, structure that, he, that he's currently a part of. So Yu Po Kin, he's the kind of guy who he does like a lot of bribing to get his way. Like if there's like a certain social or political figure that he needs to see eye to eye with him, he's going to set out to bribe them, set out to corrupt and rig the game so that, you know, people do what he wants or people are living and acting the way that he desires. And there's this one guy named Dr. Veraswamy, and... He uh, is not really taking bribes from this guy, Yu Po Kin. And since he won't take these bribes, this guy, Yu Po Kin, comes up with these ideas about how he can get rid of him, right? And the way to do it, in his opinion, is to just destroy his social reputation. It's like, if this guy won't take bribes from me, I'll destroy his reputation in, like, the public social world. So he's going to try through, you know, the publications of, like, certain articles to trash 
and dismantle this person's, this guy, Dr. Veraswamy's, like, social reputation amongst the Indians and the Englishmen in Burma. Then the story goes to the main character, James Flory. This guy, James Flory, he's an Englishman. Um, you know, one thing that the book talks about is he has, like, a birthmark all along, like, the left side of his face. And this birthmark, it doesn't look very good, according to the novel. And because of that, this guy is, like, really like embarrassed by it he doesn't like to show his birthmark like if he's talking to you he might turn his head like a certain way so that the birthmark you know doesn't show in front of you and this guy James Flory he spends a lot of his time as an Englishman uh, hanging out at the like social club that the white people in that area have right? they have this like social club that they hang out in they drink a lot they smoke a lot they just hang out you know, make a lot of jokes, just talk about like what's going on in their lives and stuff like that. Just basically a way for them to, re to relax. And then one day when they're hanging out at the club, there's a note that comes in saying that um, there's this move now to try to get native people to join the club. At this point, and at this time, it's only white Europeans that can be in this club. But uh, this note says that natives and Indians and Burmese people, they should be able to join the club too. And that doesn't really go over well with a lot of the people at that club. And, you know, there's these different guys at this club. There's one guy, Mr. McGregor, another guy, uh, Mr. Larkson. Uh, and there's this other guy named Ellis. And this guy, Ellis, is a racist, right? He says these really, like, messed up racist things. He's just, like, a racist person towards Indians. And he is like, nah, they sh that shouldn't happen. They shouldn't be able to join this club. This club's only for white people. That's it, blah, blah. And, you know, there's other people in that club who kind of hold that same sentiment, but um, James Flory doesn't. Uh, I'll just call him Flory for short, right, because that's how the book refers to him. So Flory doesn't hold that sentiment, right? He doesn't think, and he's not a racist. He doesn't think that natives or the Indians should not be allowed into the club. He thinks that, you know, uh, they're on the same level as any white person. So he, over the time, as he's hung out at this club, he's gotten more and more annoyed at the racist comments, at the racist ideas that some of these other white guys have. And because of that, and because of the other members' racism, he kind of feels like, you know, they're all idiots and that he doesn't want to spend as much time as he usually does with them because of their differences of ideas. <clears throat> so then after he's at that club and after they talk about whether they should let Indians into the club or not, um, he goes to visit this guy, Dr. Veraswamy. Uh, and Dr. Veraswamy and Flory are friends, right? They've got like a history, they've done like different things, they've gone and hung out many different times, and they like to talk a lot and just spend time with each other, and they've had dinners with one another. So at this point, they know each other pretty well, and they're pretty good friends. It's interesting because George Orwell, with these two different characters, you know, he has them sit down and they talk. And Dr. Veraswamy is an Indian, right? He's a native. And he is actually of this like messed up mindset that the English and the whites are superior to him and the native people, right? He's basically bought into this like colonial idea that the white men and the English, that they are superior and that they have brought, you know, progress and civilization to Burma. That without these people, uh, you know, the natives are nothing and that the English and the, uh, that the English and the white people have improved their life. Um, and this is an Indian guy saying that, right? But then James Flory, he's white, and he says the opposite. He says that, um, you know, we really haven't really brought progress. We've kind of just made slaves of the native people. They get into this discussion and this debate over whether the English have improved the civilization, and they, whether they brought more progress to the people, or whether uh, they've made it worse. So after they talk about that, um, they kind of switch subjects, and Dr. Veraswamy, he tells Flory, he's like, listen, I've got a problem. There's this one, like, social figure named uh, Yupo Kin. He's looking to destroy my social reputation, to, like, basically just destroy my name and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he just talks about how dangerous it is because this guy, Yupo Kin, is very, you know, he's very powerful. This guy, Yupo Kin, he talks about how he's dangerous, how he's destroyed people's reputation and destroyed their lives before. So it's a pretty big deal to him. He's in a pretty tricky spot because he's not taking bribes from Yupo Kin. So Yupo Kin is trying to, like, just destroy his reputation. 
And at that point, you know, uh, Dr. Veraswamy says that if he could be a member at Flory's Club, then that would be huge. Because in their society, having an English white guy who you're on good terms with, if you're on good terms with them, it makes your reputation as an Indian or as a native look much better, right? So Dr. Veraswamy, he's like, man, if I could only just be a part of that club, then I would, you know, be helped out a lot by that, right? And it's funny because that's what they just talked about that day at the meeting. Um, but Flory, he doesn't like to really go against what the club says because there's like a lot of conflict. And so because there's a lot of conflict, it makes it very difficult for him. Like if he says, I think that we should let natives and Dr. Veraswamy into the club, there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are like, no, that's BS. And no, we can't have that happen and all this kind of stuff. So... You know, there's a lot of, like, conflict and tension that Flory doesn't want to get himself involved into. He wants to just ease back and let things unfold as they're going to be. And Dr. Veraswamy verifies. He's like, look, I'm not saying I'm, th I'm trying to have you go to the club and say I'm a member. I'm just explaining to you that this is what's going to happen. Like, this is what would help me a big time. If I could just be a part of this club, then it would be a lot harder for this guy, Yupo Kin, to, like, tarnish my reputation, right? And the book talks about how deep down Dr. Veraswamy would love it if Flory would put forth an effort. You know, he, he's not going to tell him that, but he, deep down he would love it if Flory would go and, you know, propose to the committee, propose to the other club members that they should let in natives and that they should let specifically Dr. Veraswamy into the club because that's going to help him in his conflict right now. But Flory, he doesn't feel like he can dedicate that effort and that energy into sticking up for Dr. Veraswamy and trying to like look out for him, which is messed up because in this book, it kind of describes Flory as being kind of like cowardish, right? Um, he doesn't really have the audacity or the strength to like stand up for the things he believes in or the things he wants to see happen. He kind of just shrinks at the like... Uh, you know, conflict or the uh, pushback that comes from people who see alternative to his view. Um, Flory doesn't, so Flory doesn't dedicate himself to making sure that he can be a member. He says, look, if the people at the club ask, I can at least vote for you, but I can't go and like actually partition and be like, or I can't actually go and like, but I can't actually go and petition and like suggest that you become a member because that's too much drama and stuff like that. So it's kind of messed up because Dr. Veraswamy is in a really bad predicament right here. And rather than having his good friend, Flory, look out for him and say, I, c I can have your back, I can get you in the club, this guy Flory kind of shrinks away and says, ah, we'll see what happens. And then before they leave each other, uh, Dr. Veraswamy says to Flory, he's like, you know, you also have to take into consideration that if he finds out that you're my friend, that this guy, Yupo Kin, might come after you and he might try to make your life difficult. Which, Flory's not too threatened by that because in this society at this time, if you're a white guy, if you're an Englishman, um, it's very difficult for people to tarnish your reputation. It's more easy to do that if you're a native. Um, so Flory's not that worried, but Dr. Veraswamy still tells him, like, you still gotta watch out because this guy might try to come at you for your reputation as well. So the next day, Flory's just hanging out at his house. Um, the book kind of describes his life like he does a lot of drinking and a lot of smoking, right? Like he'll wake up and he just takes a shot or has like a glass of whiskey or, and, you know, drinks some gin. So he does a lot of drinking, a lot of smoking. And, you know, it seems as if his life is like, you know, kind of depressing. And he also has a servant, like a native who takes care of him, who like helps him do things around the house or like, you know, uh, puts out his clothes for him or like, you know, makes a meal for him. And eventually he has this girl that he uh, is seeing, like a mistress that comes over and, uh, you know, they have sex and stuff like that. But, you know, the book describes that like when they sleep together, you know, after that's done, he always like treats her really badly and tells her to leave. And, you know, she he's like, you only like me because I'm white and because I have this money. And, you know, like, they always get into these arguments and these fights. And then he tells you, like, to, like, leave and treats you badly. And the book describes that that happens every single time they're hanging out. It always goes that way. So 
Um, it seems like his love life is reduced to these relationships where he's just kind of like sleeping with this one woman and like kicking her out of his house afterward. So after that, he goes and he hangs out in the jungle, just walking around, appreciating the nature. And he has this dog that he takes with him. And he sees like the birds and the trees and like the flowers and all that stuff and the book talks about how he like while he's looking at all of the nature and like the birds and stuff like that he feels like this deep sense of loneliness right he feels like he's truly alone in life and that you know you have all of this beauty of the nature and the jungle around him but like what is it worth if he doesn't have anyone to share it with so basically I guess what Orwell is trying to show us here is just this is a character who you know has a deep sense of loneliness. He might be trying to plug that loneliness in with all the alcohol and like the smoking that he does as a way to like plug in that hole of like what he's missing in life. But what he wants is he wants someone that he can share life with. So then later he goes to the uh, club, right? The social club where they all hang out and drink. And there's this uh, publication in the paper that talks about like stuff they don't like and they blame it all on Dr. Veraswamy, like the other guys at the club, like Ellis, the really racist guy, and like some of the other people, they blame all this like negative publications on Dr. Veraswamy. And like they're really outraged. And so they make a sign that basically says like no native, no Indian can join our club and stuff like that. And they get the different members of the club to sign it. And, you know, rather than actually sticking up for his friend, uh, Flory just signs the sign, right? He signs his, like, the different members sign the sign they'll be putting up. And Flory puts his signature on there instead of sticking up for his friend. So that when he leaves the club, he's, like, beating himself up mentally like, you're a coward, you're, like, weak, you can't stand up for your friend, you can't, like, handle, like, the social backlash amongst your fellow club members to stick up for this person who you consider to be a friend and who would help you out if they had the chance, you know? So there's a lot of like, I guess, self-esteem issues with him. He's very critical of himself rather than looking at himself in like a positive way of like, I can stand up for this, I can stand up for that. He looks at himself negatively, you know? You know, the same way that he has a birthmark, like a physical characteristic that makes him feel ashamed and, you know, makes him feel bad about himself. He also has an internal characteristic, which is his cowardice, which makes him feel bad about himself. Uh, social psychologists and personality psychologists, they usually talk about, you know, the differences in terms of like a self, right? We all have this concept of ourselves that's in our heads and how we think of ourselves, how we imagine ourselves and how we view ourselves, our abilities, our talents, our characteristics and things like that. And we all have a actual self, which is who we actually are. And then we also have a sense of an ideal self of who we would like to be, right? The kind of person that we want to be, the kind of person that we think we should be. And when you find that there's a discrepancy between the ideal self and the actual self, you can have like a problem mentally where you feel like you're falling short of a standard and therefore you aren't worthy, you know? So in this case, Flory might have this concept of himself or this ideal self-concept that's like, I would be strong, I would be courage courageous, I would be able to stick up for my friends when they need my help. But his actual self falls short of that ideal self. He's not courageous. He's not able to stick up for his friend. He's a coward and he can't stick up for his friend in a situation where his friend might need him the most. The book then gives us more of like a deep insight into Flory by showing us that, you know, um, when he was a kid, in school, he was bullied because of his birthmark on his face. You know, they came up with different like nicknames for him. They called him uh, Blue Face. Then they came up with another nickname for him, which was Monkey Butt, which is like a pretty <laughs> messed up nickname for someone. But they would call him like Blue Face or Monkey Butt for his like birthmark on his like face. So ever since he was young, he put up with like a lot of criticism in that way. Eventually, as he grew older, he kind of like outgrew the uh, bullying. But you know. Still, from like a young age, he was kind of picked on, kind of uh, judged and criticized for his physical appearance. But he's actually not so much of a coward, it seems, because one day when he's out and about in the jungle, he sees a girl being attacked by like a buffalo. Like this buffalo is like 
kind of like intimidating her. And so like Flory goes and he like pushes the buffalo away and the buffalo like runs off and he like saves her from this buffalo. And they start to talk and, and you know, they find some common uh, areas of interest between the two of them. They, uh, t as they talk, they realize they both love books a lot. Uh, they both uh, enjoy shooting. And, uh, you know, they find common ground between one another and they kind of click. So, you know, as they're like bonding, they're bonding at eventually Flory invites her to her ha to his house and they're kind of like bonding on the uh, veranda. And the girl that I had mentioned previously, right, the girl that Flory kind of like hangs out with, that, you know, he like sleeps with her, but then he kicks her out. She's at the house and she comes outside. So, you know, she speaks like a different language to the girl he's just saved because she's native. And she asks him like, who is she? And, you know, uh, you know, he's just kind of like, get out of here or I'm going to beat you, right? Like, that's like literally what he says in the book. He's like, I'm going to beat you if you don't go away. So she goes away. And then, uh, you know, Flory and, like, this girl that he just saved, they, like, start talking and they're bonding. And she's actually, a, a, like, a white English woman, too. So, like, she speaks English, he speaks English, and they're, like, talking and bonding with one another. And that girl, her name is Elizabeth. So he kind of starts forming, like, a little bond with Elizabeth after they meet and after he saves her life. Then the book talks about Elizabeth, right? Like, it gives a little bit of her background that she was born, um overseas and uh, she lived like a lot of her life in Paris and she's developed um, like an aversion to poverty like she hates anything that has to do with being poor and she has like a high standard kind of like high taste she wants to be like rich she wants to be like wealthy and she only appreciates like the lavish lifestyles and like detests being poor the problem with that though is she's lived most of her life being poor so her mother was like an artist who cared mostly about just like making art making art making art and so like the house would be a mess there would be dirt and dishes and like food everywhere and you know uh elizabeth would be like oh my gosh this sucks but her mom would just be like ah oh, it's not that big a deal it's more important for me to focus on making art than me doing like all this household stuff so she elizabeth um grew up in like a poor condition and that's only contributed to her desire to like avoid poverty and like you know have like a more like wealthy lifestyle so eventually though her mom died and she had a family in Burma so she moved to Burma and like her uncle and her aunt were like oh you know we need to find you a husband you know when you come over here a lot of the natives will be attracted to you because you're a white woman and stuff like that so uh, you know they she comes over to Burma partially to find a husband and also to be with her family there but eventually like you know, the next day, Flory goes to the social club, and she's there, and he's like, hey, you know, you should go ahead and come hang out with me, we can go for, like, a walk and stuff like that, and she's like, yeah, sure, right, so they go for, like, a walk, they're hanging out, and there is this dance, so they takes her to this dance, like, this native dance called, uh, Pue, it's literally spelled P-W-E in the book, so I guess that's how you pronounced it, like, Pue, I don't know, but anyway, uh, he takes her to this dance, and it's like a native dance where they're sitting with all of the natives, they're sitting with all of, like, the Indians, and, like, they have this girl who comes out and dances, and Yupo Kin is there, and Yupo Kin is like, oh, hey, come over here, sit with me over here, and he kind of, like, gives them these seats at the front, and they bring in, like, the best dancer, because they see that these two white people have joined them, so they bring out the best dancer for them, and this girl is dancing, and, like, it's all part of, like, the native culture. And Flory, he likes it. He's like, man, look at this dance. Look at the way she moves. You know, look at uh, how they do this dance and all this kind of stuff. And he's fascinated by, like, their culture, right? Because Flory's open-minded. He doesn't think that the natives are, you know, inferior. But this girl, she also has, like, these racist ideas. And she's like, oh, my gosh. You know, she, like, detests the native ritual and the native culture and all that stuff and like in the middle of the of the dance she's like I gotta go I can't be here it's time I go back to like the social club and so she just like goes and then he follows her and he's like trying to apologize like oh my bad I should have thought you might not like it you know I you know all that kind of stuff but and, and you know so you know she's like upset about it but like eventually like she kind of calms down and like you know she forgives him for taking her to that event and he's like sorry for it taking her there after like they kind of make up and she forgives him they go into the club 
and you know uh, some of the club members are talking with Flory and they're like oh man you know like she likes you she actually came here to like you know part of the reason she came here is to like find a husband so you're gonna be getting married soon and they're kind of like clowning him and like talking like trash and all that stuff and Flory's kind of like hesitant like oh man like I'm not trying to get like that's not the first thing on my mind isn't getting married but that's what they tell him he's gonna get into if he keeps seeing this girl so after he hangs out with this girl um, his servant, like Flory, his servant starts to see like changes in his life. So now Flory is drinking less, he's smoking less, and what that kind of insinuates is like he's starting to find like something to like clog in the loneliness. Like now he has this girl that he can hang out with, that he can talk to and bond with. So maybe he doesn't need to drink so much and smoke so much to like take care of that loneliness. Maybe he can just, you know, he doesn't really need that stuff anymore. So it's interesting to see how that, you know, finding this girl results in like a complete, not a complete, but like a pretty decent behavior change in Flory's life. At least enough of a change that uh, his servant actually recognizes it and says, you know, there's starting to be these changes in his lifestyle. Anyway, that's how far I've made it in this book so far. And so far I've liked it. Um, I think that if you like books that take you into like different cultures and show you like discrepancies between like the ways of life and you know just different people from different backgrounds like mingling and coexisting with one another this is interesting it's obviously outdated because this guy like George Orwell lived a while back you know this book was written I think in like the 1930s so like you know obviously there's like a lot of outdated ideas um, a lot of like racist ideas in this book because the people are living back in that time when that was like more acceptable um, Obviously, like, if you know George Orwell's work, he obviously would look down on that kind of stuff. And he's, I think this book is, like, very much critiquing, like, the racist outlook and, like, the imperialistic attitude of, like, the English people at that time. Especially because that's, like, Flory's outlook. Flory is not like the others in his racist outlook. He's different. Um, that's where I'm at in this book so far, so I'll be making videos in the future just to talk about the book more. Um, when I catch up and get further along in the book. So um, if you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Uh, click the subscribe button if you haven't subscribed yet. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.